Yay, thanks so much for coming out. It's so exciting to get to hang out with you all and to discuss A Prayer for the Crown Shy, which is just such an incredible book. And I wrote down like a hundred questions. We're going to get to all of them. It's Yay. just going to be super rapid fire. So <laughs> I'm actually, I'm going to kind of just, I'm, I'm now shuffling the order of them because I'm just sort of like, so I feel like one of the things that I really resonated with um, in A Prayer for the Crown Shy is that it feels like there's like, and this is in the first book too, it feels like there's like kind of an undercurrent of burnout. Yeah. There's a lot about burnout in these books and it's kind of about like feeling okay about burnout. And I was wondering if you can kind of talk about that and why that might be a thing that is kind of resonant or that, you know, feels like it's a thing worth writing about right now. Oh, I think cause I burned out. <laughs> um, <laughs> and who hasn't lately, right? I mean, I think that um, everyone's exhausted and perpetually so, and there's no end to it in sight. And um, I was feeling it while I wrote these books. Everybody I knew was feeling it. And um, I assume that this is a feeling that most people here are familiar with and that you were, well, I at least was kicking my own ass about it all the time. Like, you know, why, why am I so tired? Why am I so, why can't I write? Why can't I get my house picked up? Like, it's not like, there's an endless parade of horrors outside. Like, what's wrong with me? It must be me. Um, and I really started challenging myself to uh, embrace not thinking like that. I'm not completely successful <laughs> yet. But um, I tend to write the things that I need to be told. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, so that's where it came from. It came from that a lot of... A lot of it was that was how I was feeling. And that's how me and mine were, you know, the people all around me were feeling. And I just wanted to give everybody permission to take a break because we need it. Badly. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I didn't no, that was on. it. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I think you write about it so beautifully in, in, in both of these books. And like most of the major turning points, especially for Dex, uh, are, are kind of where they are realizing that the thing that they have been doing for a long time, the thing that they were really good at and that defined them is no longer going to be their thing. Mm -hmm. And like, it's just, it kind of sneaks up on you in a way that I think is really like, it's not like, it's not as dark or as bleak as it could be. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And is, is that your way of kind of trying to like deal with it in a more kind of positive or more kind of gentle way? I think so. I think so. And I think also it's important to remember that, um, you know, just because most of the material stuff in your life is good doesn't mean that you can't feel messy at the same time. I think um, I definitely get caught in that. I know a lot of people get caught in that of, well, I have it so good. What's my problem? Um, and it's something that trips everyone up. And um, I, I felt it was important to have to have a story about that, a, st a story in which Dex's struggling is valid, that Dex's struggle is real, even though the world around them is good and their profession is good and they make a lot of people happy and yet they still lie there at night wondering what their point is and why it is that they can't just hold still. And, um, I don't know. I, I felt that there was a lack of stories in which problems are, are small, you know, like, right, right. and, and that's not to say that I don't love some big crunchy problems when I'm reading <laughs> a book, but, um, but I, I wanted be, because I, I saw it in the, the folks in my space. I was like, I, I, I want it to feel, I want people to be able to pick up these books and say, and, and to be told, um, it is okay if you feel this way. It's okay, um, and it and it's just as worthy of a story. It's just as worthy of finding triumph at the end of it as it is for, you know, big flashy protagonists with big crunchy problems. Like the little stuff matters too. Yeah, and um, before I, well, actually before we go on, I you know do something I should have done at the start and show of hands who how many of people have actually read the first book in in the series at, at least. Okay, cool. So most most of you, uh, a psalm for the wild built. And have any of you read a, a prayer for the crumb? Uh, wow, you're fast. Okay, so yeah, a few of you. Okay, yeah, I got an arc, so I w I could read it leisurely and actually reread it, which was lovely. It's it's a book that's even better when you reread it, which is kind of the acid test, I think. 
um, other than just like dropping acid and reading a book. That's the That's other also... acid test. But um, yeah, so I mean, I actually had to work really hard to make not all of my questions about MOSCAP because I wanted to ask a million questions about MOSCAP. So I was like, no, I have to have some questions about DEX as well. And so, but here's a MOSCAP question. Yeah. <laughs> um, that previous question was a little bit more about DEX. And like, so, I mean, there are all these tropes about robots in, in science fiction, and usually they're, they're kind of like at odds with nature. They're usually kind of, they belong in a very artificial kind of sterile world, and we're always being told that they will live forever. And there's a bunch of other tropes that it feels like you're kind of turning on their head with Moscap. Like Moscap is very aligned with nature and very kind of like fascinated with the natural world and kind of at odds with the artificial and also very comfortable with mortality. So... Was that a conscious thing that you wanted to kind of turn all these robot tropes upside down, or was it just a thing that kind of came out of conceiving the character? I love you for asking this question, because yes, I have such a bee in my bonnet about robots. Ooh, Ooh I want to hear about your bee. My... Let, it, let it out of your bonnet. <laughs> I actually literally did have a bee in my bonnet once. I keep bees, and I got one in my, oh my, God. In my hood. And um, it was my fault. Everything that goes wrong with beekeeping is always my fault. But it was all, as I was there sort of gently terrified, I also was like, this is really funny. I can now <laughs> say I have literally had a bee in my bonnet. You oh all don't God. need to know this. Anyway, so um, moss cap, robots. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Um, I think that the, the way we juxtapose emotion and logic, the way we juxtapose nature and technology, the way we juxtapose science and religion as polar opposites, zero sum game, these things cannot coexist. It's wrong. I, it, I, it's just plain wrong. Um, logic and emotion, we have both. We, I do right now. Um, I mean, maybe that's news to you all, but yes, I possess both. <laughs> um, Science and nature, or sorry, science and 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 religion, um, not the enemies that we think that they are, or that that we are told that they are, and that has never really been the case. I mean, I guess Galileo, but you know, whatever. Um, and then uh, nature and technology. Nature and technology really bugs me because technology is just tools, mm -hmm. right? There is nothing inherently evil about technology. There is nothing inherently destructive. There is nothing inherently extractive about technology. Those are all the things we choose to do with it. Um, and so Mosscap was a character very intentionally, um, and Dex as well, because Dex is, um, you know, the proponent of a religion that worships the natural world as opposed to the supernatural but moss cap um is where i married nature and technology as they should be i think they'd be a happy couple um and it yeah i don't think that these things need to be i it's not even that it just bugs me that they're always presented that way it's that i think it's it's harmful that they are that we draw these lines between um, nature and us and technology and us. And we're like, oh, well, the only way to live in harmony with the natural world is if, you know, we cut back and, you know, like all the stuff we've made is the enemy of that. It's like, well, no, the stuff we've made is how we understand what nature is. We can't do that without observing it. Um, it's just a matter of how we use it and the kinds of tools we make and the, the ends we're trying to meet with that. Um, so, yeah, I put that all into one dude. <laughs> one one person one one non-person <laughs> one non-person one non-person yeah i mean i just i love how moss cap kind of constantly is delighted by like every natural thing and by every kind of every little creature every bug every every turtle every flower it's just it's so it's so joyful and so kind of like kind of Taoist in a way i don't know i mean so actually about religion another thing that i thought about that is a way that you kind of turn things sideways is so sibling dex is a tea monk which is you know as you all probably know is somebody who makes tea for people and is kind of a part of a holy order kind of but you know you expect a monk to be a certain way and dex is is weirdly horny for a monk yeah like dex is not, not even dex is extremely horny by any standard but especially by the <laughs> standards of how monks are usually portrayed and is that another case of you trying to turn things sideways or is that just because it was really, that was a thing that kind of made the character come alive for you or. So, um, and I don't mean this with any 
disrespect to any anybody's beliefs or any 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 faiths that may be present here in the room with us today. Uh, so I grew up Catholic. I am not anymore. Um, and I this too is another one of those polar opposites in that um, sex and physical pleasure and the enjoyment of the tangible, touchable, edible things around you um, is so often um, not just portrayed, but believed to be this um, hindrance to being able to connect with something greater. In my life, those are the things that do connect me to something greater. Um, and I wanted to show that those things are holy, those things are uh, good, those things are part of fully living the life that you've been given, this one precious life that you have. Um, yeah, I wanted to have a horny monk because, the, uh, the, and to not have it be a transgression of their faith, to not have it be like something they're doing on the side. No, De Dex bangs another monk in the first book, or like it said that they did. <laughs> Spoilers, I guess. But anyway, um, yeah, it's part of life, and what Dex worships is life at its fullest. Comfort, right? Yeah, like it's small comfort. comforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I love that, and I love the whole pantheon, and I love how like built out that whole system is. So, I mean, the first book um, obviously is mostly just sibling Dex and Mosscap kind of on their own traversing the wilderness. And, um, and now this book, they're among people and it's a very different kind of feel because it's a more social, it's a book that's more kind of populated and more social. Was that a huge challenge to like build out the society and, and did that, how do you feel like that changed the dynamic or did you think about that changing the dynamic between the, your two characters. I did think about that because the the first book they're in this this sort of cozy bubble together, and then there's the inevitability of you have to leave that, you have to go interact with the world. They could go live in the middle of nowhere forever, but Dex can't find food out there, and Mosscap wanted to go see um, human society, and so it is this. It was a challenge for them, and it was a challenge for me as well, figuring out how to keep the focus on the intimacy of their relationship and on the the uh, the further growth of their friendship, right? Because this friendship is really only a week old when we start this book, you know? And so they are still getting to know each other and they are still growing together. And yet they have this understanding that's, that's there from the jump and they have to figure out what their dynamic is, not only with each other, but how that changes around other people. The early chapters in the book are very much Dex trying to figure out how to be a good bridge for Mosscap and the people they encounter, how to protect Mosscap without being maternalistic or, or paternalistic about, I don't know what the gender neutral, how to be parental. parental? There we go. In loco. Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I got very distracted by that. There should be a word for that. Um, yes. Um, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, making, writing a book up that is, ultimately about how these two individuals interact with each other when the whole conceit of it is, and now you have to go interact with the world. So it was something where I had to keep pulling back and sort of looking at the forest instead of the trees, as you often do when you're writing a book of, okay, like I wanted to make sure there was enough balance between these um, very personal conversations they're having between each other, but also making sure that the world felt um, fully fleshed out that we got a good sense for the other people around them. Um, it was, it, yeah, it was, it was a lot of juggling. Um, and you, you all can, can let me know if I pulled it off <laughs> or not. So, you, I mean, I feel like you often write about worlds where there's kind of a, kind of a collectivism and there's kind of, you know, a, a kind of socialist, non, a kind of eco-socialist, you know, system in place and also worlds in which people are kinder and more generous to each other than they are in our world. And I'm, I'm wondering how those two things go together in your mind and how you see yourself as being in, in dialogue with things like, I don't know, the dispossessed and other kind of stories of, of anarchist kind of quasi utopias. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, Le Guin is why I'm sitting here right now. You know, I I loved I loved sci-fi growing up. You know, I watched Star Wars and Star Trek, and I just you know was gobbling it up all the time. But it was much more of a fantasy reader as a kid. Um, I found it a lot more accessible, um, and I saw my I could more easily see myself in those stories um, as a young girl. Um, when I was 14, I had uh, my English teacher handed me The Left Hand of Darkness and said, I think you'll really like this. And I did. Huh? Oh um, That's a good teacher. Oh I know, gosh. right? Um, her books showed me what else science fiction could be. And that is not to say that there weren't like awesome philosophical discussions being had in the other things I was already consuming. But it was the first time I really looked at it critically. And it was the first time I had really stepped out of the, the box of, you know, you got to go blow up a planet if it's going to be, you know, real sci-fi. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I mean, I love blowing up planets. Same. So yeah, it's good fun. Um, but she showed me that things can be different. And the dispossessed was one that was, um, really important to me in my teens actually because that too was just like wow it was just this thought experiment it was this beautiful thought experiment um that boiled down to well what if the world was different and it it shifted my lenses so hard and i think that there is something really radical in in science fiction as a genre because you are intentionally taking out time out of your day to not just think about a world that is different, but to fully inhabit it and to feel it and to live it for a little bit. And I, I think that that's vital in the here and now when we, we all feel so stuck and so, you know, everything is inevitable. This is just how the world is. Taking time, dedicating time to imagining here's something else, that's huge, I think. I'm biased, but I think it's huge. Um, and so, coming around to why I write stories with, um, you know, very communal societies, very um, sort of collectivist thinking. It's because my aim is to write f futures that um, feel good, that feel like a future you would want to be part of. Scary futures are important too. Um, we need our cautionary tales, but I think it's also important to have things to point your compass toward. And my personal belief is that you can't have a healthy, sustainable future if you don't recognize that you're part of a social species. And if you don't recognize that we are none of us individuals alone, there is none of us are self-made. We are all standing on the countless shoulders and bones and everything of everyone who came before us. We are all being held up by each other constantly. And so that's why those kinds of societies are at the heart of what I write because I think that's the only way we're going to have a future is if we adopt that kind of thinking. Yeah, there's a great quote from Bayard Rustin where he says, we are all one, and if we don't know it, we will find out the hard way, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. I love that's how great. he puts that. So I feel like one of the things that's been giving me a lot of life in the last like maybe 10 years has been this increase in the number of stories where like artificial intelligence and robots especially are like characters who have like rich inner lives and like obviously there's been things like Westworld but also Murderbot and you know Person of Interest but also your books and like why do you think that we're now kind of um seeing through the eyes of of robots and artificial intelligences more Ooh, that's a good question I think the fact that we all have a phone in our pocket all day long probably has something to do with it. We do. We have a much more, um, we, have, we have such a, a constant, ever-present relationship with technology in a way that, um, I mean, obviously some of this technology is so new in terms of the span of human history. But, I mean, if we think of technology as tools, right? Um Tools are typically something that are that's highly specialized. You know, if you're a builder, you have a hammer. If you are a painter, you use a brush. Everyone has a computer in their pocket all the time. I think it's something that's much more on our mind because um, information technology is completely inescapable now. It's something that is part of our everyday in the most casual ways. Like I was in my hotel earlier and I wanted to order lunch and I had to use my phone because it was a QR code. And like... <laughs> You know, it's it's there in the in the quietest, subtlest ways. And I think that um, 
the fact that we're that the past decade has seen this proliferation of stories about artificial intelligence, stories about robots, I think is just one of those things that happens that in 50 years you can look at the trends growing alongside each other and you're like, well, of course we're telling stories about the feelings we have for our technology. My wife is so sweet on our Roomba. Like Aww. she anthropomorphizes it to a ridiculous degree. Like she calls it our idiot daughter. And like, uh, huh. um, I took, and the other day I did this thing. I didn't even realize I did. I saw, um, the Roomba got stuck and I could see exactly what the logic problem was. And my wife wasn't home. So I took a picture of it to show to her to be like, look, can you see what the problem is? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, did we just take like a cute picture <laughs> the way our friends with kids do of like, look at this stupid thing our kid did. And I did it with the robot. So huh. I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, it's it's one of those trends, right? It's it's the same as how, um, you know, in the 60s, 70s, when you started having a lot of research being done into, for, for good or for ill, but into, um, you know, um, the potential of, of psychic energy, of like these sort of extra physical experiences, you see the same thing happening in sci-fi, right? You see the same thing of like, one day we will unlock the other 30% or whatever of our brain and you have these very transhumanist sorts of stories coming out of that. I think that our current slate of robot stories is just an outgrowth of that. Yeah, one of the things I love about this new book, especially A Prayer for the Crown Shy, is, is, is just all these beautiful descriptive passages that you have and just like the way you describe nature and the way you describe kind of things and like the way you just... How does that happen? Like, why are you so good at description? I'm actually kind of, I'm actually, I was like, oh, I wish I could write description this well. Cause it's just like, it's so, there's so many passages I marked where I was like, oh my God, that's just so beautifully like conjured. That's incredibly kind. I don't know what to say. Um, I will tell you, I will tell you though, that I, I don't start with that uh -huh. when I write. So I have a, I have a theater background. Um, and so I typically write dialogue first. A friend of mine calls it prose script in which it will literally just be like Dex colon line, oh. Moscat colon line. And I will write it like it's a stage play. Oh. Um, and then I go th I don't always do it like this. Like sometimes I do have like a, a chunk of something I want to put down, but when I'm just figuring out the characters, when I'm figuring out the flow of the scenes, I'm just doing dialogue. And then I go through and block like you would with a play and the descriptions you were so kind about. Um, that's me just painting the set is the way I think of it. I just sit there and I picture it and I write down wow. what I'm thinking of. Yeah. And is it something that you kind of rewrite and rewrite or is mm -hmm. it something Constantly, because like, yeah. it's just, they're it's just, just, it's so oh, inefficient. Like, <laughs> no, but that's amazing. I, I, I do the script thing too, but I, then the description is still just like, there was a thing. It did a thing. Moving on. I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> that oh. is not true. I, I don't read know. your books. That is not true ah, at all. Okay. So, um, I still have a bunch of questions, but we're going to open it up to y'all in, in a few minutes. If y'all have any questions, so please start thinking of questions and, you know, we'll just call on you, I guess. And um, so, I mean, do you think of these books as kind of a romance, like between Dex and, and Mosscap? I think of it, I think of it in a more platonic sense, but it is very intimate, I think. And I, and that's something um, that is something I like to play with in a lot of my work um, is looking at love outside of what we traditionally think of as romance, intimacy outside of what we traditionally associate with those terms, Dex and Moscap are not physically intimate. Dex and Moscap are not in love with each other, but there is a connection there um, that I don't think either of them are going to find anywhere else. And I, I think that that sort of, you know, a, a bond that goes starts to go beyond friendship, but in a way that's really difficult to define that we don't really have a good word for. Um, is where I see them heading through this book um, in that they just, they just get each other. They understand each other on a level that they've both been looking for. Um, but it, it's not a relationship that has a nice tidy label to it. What do you call a wandering monk and a robot? I don't know. That's why it's called monk and robot. That was the best, <laughs> <laughs> the best I could do. 
You call them a cab. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, I have more questions, but if y'all have questions, we can open it up. Anybody? Okay, Susan. See, I feel like my answer is going to be disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I have not studied philosophy. I, I I just sit around and make stuff up. So um, thank you for thinking I'm smart. <laughs> that means I win. Um, no, I I mean I I like to. Um, I like to describe writing books as making dinner out of whatever leftovers you have in the fridge. Um, and that's, that's what this one very much is to me. It is an amalgamation of stuff I've read, stuff I've thought about, conversations I've had, things that make me go, ooh. Uh, my, my, <laughs> my, my fields of expertise are a mile wide and an inch deep. And I just um, love just getting my fingers on a little bit of everything. So... Um, I, I wish I had some very clever erudite answer for you. I don't. I'm just a magpie when it comes to uh, learning things and thinking about them. And that's all this book is. Hi. Uh, I guess you were the hoodie, possibly. Yeah. I don't know. Is that a hoodie? Is it a oh, sweater? A sweater. sweater? Got a zipper. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. I love it. So uh, I've only read the first book, and at least the kind of way it was presented in that book is that the robots could live forever, but they choose to kind of, at the end, when they start to degrade, to kind of repair themselves, and kind of that all of those parts can kind of just last them forever. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is that kind of part of the magic of the world, that even the subcomponents never degrade, or are the robots still doing some kind of manufacturing to like make more wires or more chips to kind of I'm so plug down their parts so they can kind of last forever? I'm I'm so glad you asked this because it's because it's answered in the second book. It's, it's actually a huge spoiler. So I've been about this a long time. I'm so happy that your quest has ended. At last, you can rest. Um, so I can say nothing further because it's in there. You're welcome. This is the grubbiest answer. I was approached by a publisher and asked, would you like to write a novella? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and then they gave me money. <laughs> and so I had to do it. Um, but I did want it, but, but that was the, the, the wonderful thing about that opportunity was, is it was blank slate. It was, what would you like to write? And um, at the time, I think I surprised my editor because I well, actually I know I did because I was I saw his face on the on the chat um because at the time I'd just been writing Wayfarers and to be taught a fortunate as well but I mean those are all space books right and uh he's like so what would you like to do I said not spaceships huh. and he went oh <laughs> in this way of maybe we should have had this conversation before I offered you a contract sort of thing but i had been playing in the spaceship sandbox for a really long time and i plan to continue playing in the spaceship sandbox but i wanted to do something different um and that was this and i felt that um i just when when that when that opportunity arose i just had a little glimmer i didn't really have a story in mind i didn't know who dex was but i saw this robot sitting in the woods and i was like i want to write about that robot um and it just it just all snowballed from there. I don't outline, and I don't. I also don't write chronologically, so I have no idea what I'm doing. 
ever. Um, if you had that impression of me, I'm sorry, but I don't. Um, but uh, novellas are actually quite challenging for me because I'm very wordy. I like to spread, like I love a novel. Like it's, it's I feel my, my natural length. Novellas are challenging, but really neat because they force you to, um, to really hone it down and figure out what the meat of the story is. Um, they're hard. I mean, you know this. They're hard. It's hard to like figure out how to just get that that little bit of it when you want to just spread out and and go farther. But I haven't done as many novellas. Oh, actually. I mean, I've done. Well, then you don't know this. They're hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I've sort of <laughs> been thinking about writing some more, some of them, but I haven't really. But see, no. you write short stories, though. I do. I and write I, short stories, and I don't write short stories because I find them too hard. Huh. I find them really difficult. So novellas are like my maximum shortness I feel. <laughs> anything anything beyond that is a punishment because I like I just like words so much and I respect I respect people who can write short so much because I I just can't I can't do it yeah I love writing short stories but I don't know anyway <laughs> we're, about, we're not talking about me so uh we can talk about you too. anybody else hi blue shirt that's a Henley yeah <laughs> Mm-hmm. Is that on purpose? Totally on purpose. Totally on purpose. Um, I don't mind violence at all. I play a ton of video games. I spend my free time blowing stuff up and enjoying it immensely. Um, but I think that it is um, depressing and, and uh, really lacking in vision to say that the only things we can imagine for the future are more clever ways of killing each other. Um, we can tell stories about things other than that. And um, so, yeah, it's it. Every, every book I write is just me doubling down on that is of th there are stories beyond conquest and conquering um, that are worth telling. Um, now, will I do that forever? I don't know. Um, but right now, that is that is the lane I like being in. Yeah, uh, EFF hoodie. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about the world that, like, I'm really scared now. It's going to be, oh, it's just answered in the second book. <laughs> <laughs> but in the other, I mean, the world is, like, so deep and clearly well imagined. I feel like you have to write a nasty. Anyway, um, so this question from the first book. Um, a thing that really struck me was the idea, like, everybody gets to not phone, phone, uh, and eventually just, like, get an upgrade over time. They're not replacing the technology as we go through the grade, um, which, like, to me as someone who makes technology uh, <laughs> the thought that like, I have to now support this forever but could it exist in a world <laughs> <laughs> uh, like if you're not constantly trying to like build a new next thing so mm -hmm. I wonder if that's like is that right have they all decided that this is actually the purpose we need to push this technology we don't need anything new or is it just like even despite that you just have like trying to support on everything how does that all fit together how do, what is the IT um, side of <laughs> Panga. Yeah. No, 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 totally. To no, I'm <laughs> for sure. For sure. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I realized that the, I'm, I'm now in this moment realizing that, um, the vision, the future of technology I've portrayed in this book is like heresy here in San Francisco. <laughs> no, I mean this so kindly. You can't see the big smile on my face. I have a huge smile on my face right now. Um, so, um, Honestly, I was thinking more the resource side of it than the support side of it. Um, I was thinking more about hardware than operating system, which is funny because I used to be a technical writer. I used to, um, when I first wrote, when I was writing uh, The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, the, the majority of my paying work at the time came from like writing software manuals, etc. So I'm with you. Yes, the support side would be a nightmare. <laughs> um, but... Um, I was thinking more about the fact that like I have all these rare metals in my bag that I carry around with me everywhere that caused untold environmental destruction to harvest uh, and an enormous amount of human suffering. Um, I will have to replace this in a few years. This thing that, that cannot, a lot of it can't be recycled. Some of it can, but a lot of it can't. 
Um, we'll just have to keep digging up more or blowing up an asteroid or however we're going to get more of it. Um, and yet I spend approximately 90% of my day on this thing, just sort of blithely ignoring all of that. Um, I often make the comment to my friends that I want the Model T of computers. Like I want something that comes with a wrench <laughs> that I can just fix forever. I wanted in Panga to show that um, any technology that is based on uh, resources that cannot be easily renewed, um, things that you that will not break down easily, things that cannot be composted, things that you cannot grow, um, is treated as something indescribably precious. Um, because it should be. For them, a building is something that's going to rot, right? Or that you can use um, mushrooms or casein or whatever it is they're building out of to grow new parts for it when it starts to break. And if you don't need that building anymore, you just let it return to nature. A computer or any sort of um, similar device requires things you cannot grow. And so in that, it is treated mm. as this this heirloom sort of thing. Um, you are going to have this one. It's going to last you your whole life and you need to take care of it. You can replace parts of it. Um, but it is, it, it's precious. It's precious because it caused harm in order to make this. And so if you're going to use this as a vital tool, um, you have to treat it, um, as the, as the rarity that it is. So I hadn't really considered this from... <laughs> The standpoint of how do you how do you patch this forever? But now you've given me something to chew on, so thank you very much. Um, that was that was where I was coming from with that. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I have the follow-on question. Mm -hmm. So on the hardware side, so yeah. inside of that computer, presumably there's like little tiny small components that were one day in the past made by the robots in the factory. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. But like at some point you run out of, you know, new little parts. Right, right, right. Um, so instead of using robots, a lot of it is is done they I mean, they still have automated machinery, right? You still have printers, you still have manufacturing, a lot of these, you know, things of that ilk. You will see some of that in the second book as well. <laughs> um what happens when they run out of it? They may, they have to come up with a new system. And I think that's what they've embraced in in every respect uh, is if we run out of a resource, if something isn't working anymore, if something starts to cause harm, that means we need to go back to square one. We need to, you know, flip the chalkboard and figure out something new. Um, so yeah, if the little parts run out, then people don't have computers anymore and we have to figure out what to do with that. And I, I think that's, that's the, I, that's the heart of Pangan culture, right? Of, of, living in harmony with the world around you, being in a, 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 a healthy part of a healthy ecosystem is paramount to anything else, even if it's a technology you'd rather not give up. Totally. Um, yeah, this is one of the reasons I love writing about aliens is because you can, because you can strip away all the bullshit, right? You can just, you don't have to worry about um, cultural norms. You don't have to worry about what's taboo. You don't have to worry about the things we get hung up about with our own bodies. Um, you can just start from scratch. And I love that freedom of being able to play with gender with sex with 
physicality with um, what constitutes intimacy, what constitutes a family. Um, and I think that it's a great way of exploring human queerness as well because it forces you to um, to challenge your your preconceptions about what you think a family is, what you think you know um, a woman is a, or how you know how a parent should relate to a child, like any of these things. Um, it's and not those answers may not always be comfortable. They they may not be always some always be something that you click with. You know, you might come away being like, "Well, I don't I don't dig that at all," and that's okay. You know, um, to me, queerness is about constantly challenging expectations and always questioning why. And so, you know, when somebody says, "Well, you can't do whatever it is," why? Why not? And aliens are for me um, a medium in which I can ask that question on a cultural level and it's endlessly fun so we probably got time for like one or two more questions Um, I just thought it sounded so cozy. I love, <laughs> I love a cozy space. Um, I, I, my house, um, up in Humboldt County is like my favorite place in the whole world. Cause it's just this little museum of stuff me and my, my wife, like, I, I think that I wanted to show, you know, because, because I had this idea that, you know, Dex is traveling from place to place. Dex is not stationary. Right. Um, being a monk of the god of small comforts, it made sense to me to have Dex take all the comforts, all the comforts that they could along with them, right? Like, um, I, I was a little bit lavish in the first book with the description of their bed, you know, and how like the the warmth of the wood around them and the lighting and everything. I I wanted you to feel that when Dex lies down to go to sleep, that you are also like, oh yeah, this is great. Like that every night they go into their little tiny home um, and just love that space and kind of don't want to leave it. Um, I, I personally, I would hate living in something that small, but I, there's something so cozy and so charming about it. I loved the idea of this, this, you know, clanking double decker thing that's just jammed with plants and tea and everything. And um, actually one of the, the visual, inspirations for it was this uh, video game Pyre, which was the game uh, from Supergiant Games that came out before Hades. It's super underrated and it's really good, but they have this wagon that they take with them through purgatory. And uh, I was like, wouldn't that be nice if it wasn't like full of like skulls and stuff? I mean, it whips when it's full of skulls and stuff, but I'd like that with a, it's a little less haunted. Um, and so I made one that was a little less haunted. Um, and also camping's nice because you get like little stuff, right? Like I love little things that like, fold, you know, fold up a thing and then all of a sudden you take it apart and you're like, oh, it's like, oh, that was a terrible answer. But you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> little stuff, little tiny foldable things that you get at REI. That's my jam. I wanted a whole wagon full of those. So I did. Cool. So do we have time for one last question, maybe? Yeah. Um, Susan? I don't know at the moment. Right now I'm working on something completely different, which I can't say a lot about right now. Uh, it's something brand new. Um, so I am leaving the door open for Dex and Moss Cap. I do not have immediate plans. I do not have a grand agenda for them at the moment. Um, so I don't know what to tell you to expect right now, but um, I think I'll, I'll probably come back around to them again. Cool. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank, thank you, you for the contenders. Yeah.